Hello, Rory McKiernan here and welcome to the Love and Courage podcast. This episode was recorded in New York City just before the corona crisis started. So I was grateful to spend time there with friends and colleagues and to catch up with lots of amazing people I know. And uh, I got to do a couple of podcast interviews there and um, delighted to be able to share this one with you. I'm thinking of all my friends and colleagues in New York City in particular, but also people all around the world in Ireland and my brother in China and elsewhere, people that have been affected by the crisis and particularly those that have become ill or lost loved ones or are particularly struggling with the isolation and the disconnection that many of us are experiencing. And I hope that we can come out of all of this uh, as transformed as individuals, as communities and as a planet, that this could be a turning point for where we are at for humanity, that we can finally start to rebalance and find a different way of being and particularly living in harmony with the planet and particularly where we might start to look out for each other better and have a kinder politics, one that is about true equality and and not favouring one segment of society over the other, where we actually truly are all in this together. And that has become in some ways a catchphrase or a mantra of the time in this together. But it's also, I would say, a question, are we really all in this together? Does that include um, asylum seekers, refugees, the homeless, people that are often on the fringes of society and neglected? So I'm hoping that this can be a catalyst for recalibration and a reset of sorts. Um, And that's not to say it's going to be easy. I don't think it will be, um, but that's where the courage comes in. And that's in many ways the theme of the podcast is about courage. It's about love and it's about transformation. So thanks everyone for supporting the podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, If you're new, you're very welcome. I want to say a big thanks uh, to the patrons behind the podcast, those that chip in on a once off and also on a monthly basis, some fantastic people uh, that have been very patient recently. I've been a bit slow to release new episodes. And the main reason being is that I've been busy launching my book. Firstly, I was trying to finish it and then launch it. Uh, The book is Hitching for Hope, A Journey into the Heart and Soul of Ireland. And it debuted at number one in the paperback non-fiction category in the Irish Times bestsellers list. Uh, More recently, it's still in the top 10. It's at number eight and the only Irish book in the top 10 in the Irish charts, which is quite amazing, really. Um, But it's a community effort. It's uh, a book about hope, a book about struggle and survival, a book about community, about kindness. And I'm getting reviews from all over the world and support from all over the world. And I did a live stream book reading um, just yesterday and um, had people tuning in from all over the world. And you you may have been one of those. And it was great to connect with so many people, uh, people I know and people I'm getting to know. And I just think the internet is opening up so many possibilities for us right now and always has been. But um, I certainly feel grateful to have it. So big thanks to all the patrons. I'm going to list a few. If you just bear with me for a moment, um, I do think it's important to celebrate and praise and thank the people that are keeping the show on the road, supporting the podcast and all of my work. Um, if you want to chip in it's just $5 a month or $10 or once off, it's all appreciated. It all goes directly into promoting the podcast and into social justice work. So big thanks to Alex Foster, Breezy Kelly, Kieran McCormick, Dan McInerney, Dara McKeown, Davey Ward, Deborah Malloy, Dermot Kirsten, Derry O'Donnell, Eamon Stack, Jimmy Darcy, John Evi, Jonathan Woods, Mairead Brady, Mary Brennan, Megan Brown, Miffy Hodge, Niall Doherty, Olive Toey, Pat Ryan, Richard Lawson, Ronan Brannigan, Sarah Winston, Sophia Duffy and Victoria Nash. And also to the anonymous uh, monthly and once off donors, it's all really genuinely appreciated. It makes a big difference. And I think it's very important to support inde- independent media and thought at this particular time and also independent artists. So I'm championing a lot at the moment the need to support arts and culture and particularly musicians and theatre makers, people that have had their livelihoods taken away from them. Um, So a lot of solidarity going out to those at the moment. One of those that I want to celebrate right now is this current guest in this episode, Andrew Boyd, who is a New York City native. He's an author, a humorist, a veteran of creative campaigns for social change. And he led the decade long satirical media campaign Billionaires for Bush, which I remember during the 
Bush era. He co-founded Agi Pop Communications, an award-winning subvertising agency, as well as the Netroots social justice movement called The Other 98%. He's the author of four books, Beautiful Trouble, Daily Afflictions, Life's Little Deconstruction Book and the Activist Cookbook and the forthcoming I Want a Better Catastrophe, Hope, Hopelessness and Climate Reality. And Andrew lives in New York City. Uh, we had a mutual friend in Chuck Collins who we who was a guest on this uh, podcast, two actual episodes. I think he's the only guest I've had that we did two interviews. One of them was a live event and one at his home in Boston. Um, so Andrew's a mutual friend. Uh, we met up in New York City. Um, just one little note. Um, it's very at the beginning of the conversation, there's a mention of a story where let's just say there was um, an encounter that wasn't all positive and it involves um, the threat of violence. Um, and in many ways, most of, the, most of the episode is about the positivity of hitchhiking and the wonder and the joy of hitchhiking. And that's been my own experience. I've never had any significant trouble or challenge or risk. But Andrew does share a reflection. So if there's sensitive ears, maybe listening in the background, um, then it just might be something to note. And I probably want to correct myself on a point as well. Uh, Andrew caught me on the hop about talking about the the quite embarrassing actually the uh, the geographical distance or length of Ireland and I think I said it was about 600 miles which isn't that big at all but I think it's actually only about 300 from what I know so just listening back I caught myself on that but look we can't be all perfect and I'm certainly not perfect so listen thanks for your patience um, I'm looking forward to sharing this episode with Andrew Boyd enjoy so, Andrew, we're in the heart of New York City and we've just got talking about hitchhiking as we <laughs> met up. And it's not really a place for, for much hitchhiking, but uh, it sounds like you've got a bit of energy around hitching. Maybe you have a few I, stories to I've share. I've hitchhiked out of Manhattan many times, but usually... Oh, I, you've hitchhiked out of well, Manhattan? Well, I take a bus across the bridge to New Jersey and then get oh. off immediately on the other side of the bridge. And then I've hitchhiked back in my salad days, back in my sort of, you okay, know... So you haven't been doing this recently. It's yeah. not. Yeah, it's yeah, been... Yeah. It's been a while. Yeah, yeah, it's been a while. So, um, so um, has hitchhiking, obviously, for, for anyone that's listening that isn't aware of my own journey, hitchhiking has been a large part of my life and it's part of my book, Hitching for Hope, another promotion part for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it is a great conversation starter because so many people do have hitchhiking stories. Either and on, the, on the sort of getting picked up end or, yeah, or, or yeah, picking it's, people up. It's yeah. a great, um, I guess it's a great mechanism for human connection, isn't it? And outside of your, you know, outside of your bubble. For sure. It's completely, you know, pretty, pretty damn random. Yeah. Who's going to pick you up? And, so, Andrew, when yeah. was your first time? <laughs> oh, gosh. Right, 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 right. Well, the first, the first big one that I remember was, I think I was 18. And I uh, was, you know, in college. It was a summer, I think, or maybe a, a break of some kind from college. And I was staying with my mom and dad in Manhattan. And I wanted to go visit some of my college friends. And they were... I went to school in Michigan, so some of them were in Ohio, in Cleveland, and we, whatever. So I was like, I just lied to my mom about something. Like, I don't remember. I was going to stay with a friend for a couple of days in the city or something, and then I just put out the thumb, you know, took the bus just across the river to get to, and then put my thumb out on the uh, on the entrance ramp of a highway and just kind of had an adventure uh, out to Cleveland. We went to a club. You know, we had uh, two days. I, hitch I, I think I hitchhiked back or took a bus back. I don't remember. That was one experience. But the one I really remember was the next big one, which was hitchhiking out to Denver uh, from New York, which is, you know, 2,000 miles. Uh, how, how wide or tall is Ireland? How many miles? Oh, thanks for putting me on the spot. It's like in, in miles. Is or, it like 600 miles? Ooh, okay, so then this is three times the yeah, length. It's, it's not like you can drive the length of Ireland in about six hours. Okay, so this is like a 20-hour you know, whatever. If you drove it, it would be like a 15 hours or 20 yeah. hours or something yeah, yeah. like that to get into Denver. Um, uh, wow. You know, yeah, because so, scale is a whole different Yeah, it's a whole other, it's a yeah. continental kind of level thing. Yeah. So that's all the way out to Colorado and you're going across the plains and a lot of... And um, all that. kinds of adventures on that one. Um, I remember getting stoned with a trucker sort of in Indiana and he was, it was, the sun was setting and, you know, he's just like a hippie, tr hippie working, white working class trucker. 
And he was like, we were barreling down Route, 8, Route 80 across the top of, of Indiana. And he said, this is the main street of the Midwest. You know, that's, that was sort of like the, 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 the lore of the truckers. That's how they referred to this strip of highway. It was like, the you know, for truckers. So that was an interesting experience. And then I ended up at night in like a truck stop. And this one guy said he would take me a little bit further along. And then the mo one of the more interesting things that happened in the hitchhiking, uh, my hitchhiking experience, the guy pulled a gun on me in the middle of the night. Like he opened the glove. We were talking about, he said, I've done a lot of hitchhiking. And so what, you know, I've, guys have pulled guns on me. You know, he was sort of talking like that. You know, what, you know, what, what would you do if that happened? And then he pulled a gun on me. And he held it to me. He held it and pointing, you know, he was driving. So my left side was sort of facing him and he was pointing it at me. And... And I felt what I think Hemingway wrote about. I remember reading like that feeling of when a gun is pointing at you, where how it feels in your in that part of your flesh where the gun is pointing at you, that you get this just a cold, a cold terror in that just one spot of your body. Um, and so I felt something like that. Um, so I read Hemingway afterwards and recognized that. And then he said, "Take your take all your clothes off." So that happened, and I'm like sitting there, and I'm what I'm thinking of is I'm thinking of my mom and I'm thinking of my mom finding my naked body, you know, like not her finding it, but her being told, uh, you know, being forced to identify photographs or whatever of my dead naked body on the side of some highway in the middle of a cornfield in, in, in Illinois. And, uh, that's, that was, you know, it's interesting what happens. You learn some things about yourself, about life, about life and death in the sort of cosmic sense and also your own sort of your own character and your own makeup uh, in moments like this. So I remember pleading with him because I didn't want, you know, that was sort of my nightmare scenario. It's like I could, I didn't want to die, but I didn't really, for some reason what I was flashing on was this experience my mom would have if I died in this way. And um, so I remember pleading with him uh, to not to leave me alone, to not do that. And then at some point he turned around the gun and handed it to me. He said, it's on, there's no firing pin. It's only a stage prop. Put it in the glove compartment. So I very much, <laughs> you know, did that. Um, and then we started to talk. And he was like, he was basically mentoring me in a very kind of existential, kind of intense, uh, unilateral, non-consensual kind of way uh, with like, how are you going to handle, if you're going to hitchhike, kid, green, wet behind the ears. He didn't say this, but this is the, you know, exactly. But basically he said, if you're going to be hitchhiking, you have to know how to handle these kind of situations because this is what kind of comes up. I think he might've been even writing a book about hitchhiking. I don't know if he was or ever did. Um, and then he started to sort of, you know, kind of rehearse, you know, talk me through the scenarios. You don't plead. You have to show strength. You have to, you know, here's the psychology of someone who might be pulling the gun on you and why, and you have to sort of outthink the situation and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But I don't remember all the content, you know, because obviously my adrenaline was, was at a, at a sort of higher peak than it had ever been. And, but I do remember not, you know, I do remember being thankful for the experience, you know, not being angry at him for putting me through it, but, but for like basically rehearsing, you know, I thought it was real. So I was going through, learning about myself or going through a kind of rehearsal of a survival situation. And so whatever kind of it, it, predicaments of that nature I've gotten into after that, I was at least my nervous system was more rehearsed, if not my strategies. Do you know what I mean? Like I was sort of, okay, this is what it feels like. This is familiar. Mm. Does that make any sense? Yeah, and I, mean, I was really grateful to him. There's so much going on. I know there's there so much. Uh, stuff. Uh, and everyone like kind of looks at me when I tell them that story, and they're like, "How could you ever forgive him? How? Could, yeah. What are you saying?" And I'd be like, "No, no, no. This was a very good thing." To yeah, have it's happened. it's clear why. Like my my reaction is similar. At one level, it's out, outrage, you know, and and sure. I think you use the term non non consensual yeah. mentoring, you know, right? Um, and. and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 like, yeah. But, but but the other image that comes to mind for some reason is is a um, Japanese Zen warrior uh, training. Yeah, get hit on the you head wanted kind of to be yeah, you wanted to be this wild spirit adventuring as a warrior of 
exploration and right. the older warrior in whatever shape they chose to come in has decided in your own interests I have to show you and in the Zen tradition quite often there's a there's a harshness to it yes that that we don't do these days we don't appreciate or we don't want or nobody wants why would you want that um and it's not for me to judge whether you, you should be grateful or not it's your right. experience right, right. And you're grateful. It's kind of a... Because he could have actually saved your life at another yes, scenario. Yes, like, uh, proact- like sort of paying it forward. Well, in yeah, yeah and in time yeah. and space, you yeah. could have done a hundred more trips and then there's a hundred more chances. And I suppose I opened up this conversation with a, with the kind of lighter side of hitchhiking as, as the, the fun element. But there is a fear element that goes around and the world is a complex place. So Absolutely. Yeah, Wow. So yeah, you're making me think with the Zen piece and the and the war the elder warrior and the younger warrior. You're making me think of this as a sort of, as a as a in a small way as a kind of an initiation. You know, as a as a sort of rite of passage, a little bit like unasked for, but but in retrospect, uh, welcomed, appreciated. Um, and then you know eventually he, you know we sort of drove on and uh, into as far as he could sort of take me. I think he drove an hour out of his way. You know, he had to sort of backtrack to get home. And this is one one thirty in the morning. And he sort of lets me out and he says, he gives me a little reflector that's helpful. If you're going to hitchhike in the dark, you know, this is helpful to have. I never hitchhike in the dark um, anymore. <laughs> but, um, and then he said, if you want to, um, since you're, I'm letting you out on the side of the road and you should sleep in between these cornfields, like in a, in a, in a, wow. in a so sort ultimately, of divot between ultimately the Ultimately, he's a caring guy. Yes. yes it's just, yes. it's, yes. wow. Yeah, it was really, really interesting. Wow. And, um, yeah, he sort of like critiqued my response. He sort of talked me through, you know. So there was a, it was a very fascinating, and you know, I'm ne- you know, again, I never knew this guy before. I had this ex- one of the more extraordinarily intense experiences of my life in that car for that hour, hour and a half, two hours, however long it was. This was thirty years ago now, thirty many years ago, thirty five years ago. So it's so I don't have all the uh, the metrics yeah. of it yeah. uh, in my mind anymore. But it was, um, yeah, so I went to sleep and I got up the next morning and continued on, went to St. Louis, then to Denver. It was a, it was a kind of an odyssey. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. It, the other thing that's coming to mind is that, um, is it a poem or a song? And it's, it's, oh, Baz, Baz something, wear sunscreen. It's, it's, it's kind of like, <laughs> it's like a desert. Oh, maybe I'm just oh. thinking. Maybe oh, it's actually Desert Dorada. He does it okay. through oh, oh, yeah. through song or spoken word or something. But it's it, the text of Desert Dorada. Yeah, but, I think but so. Put to but song. I think okay. ultimately there's a line in that, like that the world is full of like the world's a beautiful place. As, and you have a book, Beautiful Trouble, oh, and, yeah. and it's a beautiful, kind place primarily, but it's also full of trickery and and there's a darkness there that we just cannot ignore. Um, two two things that I one thing the way you were talking about the sort of warrior and the sort of initiation we were talking about is I did, you know, sort of think of this, I did a lot of this cross-country hitchhiking in those years, and then I did a bunch of freight jumping as well. And so I thought of that kind of as my, like a kind of, okay, you know, uh, like a trial by fire a can you bit. Can you explain to listeners who oh. might be aware uh, about freight jumping and it's freight train jumping. Freight train yeah, jumping, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. It's we, a thing we, in the... we don't really have that oh, right, in our like, much of a culture. Yeah. <laughs> that's fair, that's fair. I don't know how much more hitchhiking, you know, I don't know how, I don't think hitchhiking is particularly prevalent anymore yeah. now. I think people yeah. feel like it's a little, it's a little dangerous. Maybe the cops crash, cut down on it or it just isn't part of the culture. But freight jumping has a long history in American sort of folklore and, uh, you know, within an, the anarchist subcultures uh, to this day, but also in the sort of uh, historic anarchist organizing movements like the Wobblies, sort of some of the Wobbly uh, international workers of the world. That was a nickname for one of the most powerful and radical uh, labor movements, turn of the century, a hundred years ago in America. And they, a lot of the organizers um, would sort of freight jump from one, you know, uh, timber mill to another um, migrant work camp or something like yeah, that as they, they did their organizing. They weren't going around in all expenses paid. <laughs> That's, fl- no, like the NGO miles. industrial <laughs> complex did not, would, probably didn't exist in the degree that it did. It did not support the Wobblies. Um, uh, they had a very radical, uh, you know, uh, worker empowerment, um, one big union, um, you know, kind of get rid of the capitalist class kind of a program. Um, and very grassroots, very grounded, um, and whatever, workers organizing workers. 
Um, Joe Hill, famous folk singer, mm-hmm. sang a lot about uh, sort of riding the rails, is what it was called. So there are still a lot of freight still gets moved uh, in America by long trains of freight cars, like almost 100, 100 freight cars uh, long. If you've read Animal Dreams by uh, Barbara Kingsolver, there's a, one of the characters in there is a, is a freight train operator, and he describes that. Um, and a hundred carriages long means it's hard to police, ultimately, I would imagine. Uh, in a, yes, in a way. And um, yeah, right. And takes a long time to assemble and get out of the yards and, mm. and whatever. Um, Woody Guthrie, you know, sang about the, the freight train jumping a lot. Um, I'm forgetting the names of the songs. Anyway, it's a, and it's a way that um, it's an, uh, sort of the most beautiful kind of way to... It's Okay, so the two times I did the freight jumping were the dirtiest, literally the dirtiest experiences in my life. Like I had the most grimiest, dirtiest, completely comprehensively dirty, like caked in in um, diesel fumes. You know, when you go into a tunnel and the diesel fumes are blowing back at you and you're just like encased in the diesel fumes and just like industrial dust blowing around inside the freight car. So they're the dirtiest experiences. But they were kind of, uh, I don't know, they were, they, I probably felt as free and pure I was trying to get with a friend from Denver to California. And instead of hitchhiking, we decided we'd try freight jumping. And we went to the Denver freight yards, which are one of the big um, the big freight yards in America. A lot of trains coming uh, between the, uh, the, the, the western coast and there it's sort of like the central hub of the mountain area and towards the prairies and to, you know, out to the Midwest, to Chicago, whatever. So it's a big, a lot of freight. But we didn't know what we were doing. We'd never freight jumped before. We hadn't read a manual so we just went to the freight yards and we we're trying to figure out how do we know which trains are leaving how to avoid if there's any sort of freight yard police um where are they going you know you and the hitchhiking you put up your sign or you put out your thumb you know which way the highways there's highway signs oh right? so you could jump on one of these and wake you could be up going in the wrong a, direction yeah or it only goes a hundred miles and you've waited the whole day to get on it or they disconnect that half of the train and leave you. You know, we don't. We didn't know anything. So basically, we were, we were just hanging around in the freight yard talking to people. There was a hobo or two. There was one other guy kind of heading by on a on a freight train, like a more of a, like a hippie young twenty something college kid like us with his backpack. And we sort of waved at him and we tried to talk to him, but we didn't understand. Basically, we just like there was a train heading what we understood to be broadly west because we saw where the mountains were. Uh, Denver's at the edge of the plains, and the mountains rise up just to the west of it. And um, and um, and we basically put up our hitchhiking signs to the conductor in the train, ah. like we were just like West or California. And he yelled something at us, and we couldn't hear what it was. But we thought he said Anaheim, which was like a a, a city uh, near Los Angeles. So we were like, maybe that's what he said, maybe not. But it's heading it's heading west. And it was this was we got there in the morning. And it was this was almost late afternoon, so we spent the whole day trying to find a train. So we're like, and "Fuck you it." Did it you did interpret that whatever the driver said was was encouraging. Yes, if he wasn't like, yeah. "Get the fuck out of the yard." Yeah, you you, re- know? you reached out to him, uh, you know, yeah. for solidarity. <laughs> That's like. right. And he, he yelled something like it felt yeah. like yeah, yeah. trying to tell us where the train was going. Yeah. So we jumped on, and um, there's a lot of different kinds of cars, and. Um, you know, it's good to jump on a train when it's moving very slowly or not at all. You make a wrong move. You know, there's the, there's the train, there's the, um, the wooden things that the rails are on, and there's a lot of gravel around it. It's very, very uneven footing. You don't want to be moving too fast with a pack on trying to jump on a train. You, you fall and you get your legs sliced off, whatever. Once again, I thought of my mom, and I did not want her to find, you know, hear that my legs had gotten sliced off and what a foolish son she had raised. Yeah, so it was kind of great. Here's this guy who's working a job. He's in the front of a train that could have a, I think it had, you know, 50 to 100 cars on it. And he said, he basically gave us an encouraging sign to jump on his train. So that was, uh, that was a uh, unexpected and wonderful. And so we ju- did. And, and I had one of the great adventures of my life. Um, we headed up into the mountains, um, woke up the next morning in the deserts of Utah, went across the Great Salt Lake, uh, which due to different salts was uh, blue on one side and pink on the other. So we thought we were kind of, you know, we didn't, we were somehow on some drugs that we didn't uh, know about. 
And then eventually we ended up in California. Um, in, we came through the, up into the mountains and uh, pine forests of California and then out, uh, out the other side. And there was the sort of the bay, San wow. Francisco Bay. And it was like, it was a classic Americana experience, a classic sort of coming of age kind of go west, you know, the sort of the dream and utopia of California. Oh, it was such a mythic experience. And, um, and it felt like, you know, we had, sur- we had found our own way. We had survived. Um, a hobo got on in the middle of Nevada and just sort of hung out with us for a few hours and then got off. He got on in some nowhere town and he got off in some other nowhere town. Um, we had one peanut butter and jelly sandwich, one apple, and one Sprite for two and a half days. So not only was I the dirtiest I'd ever been, I was pretty much the hungriest I had ever been. And then we, we jumped off the train in the sort of a, a little town next to Oakland, walked through that, and went to sleep in a park, in a public park that night. And a cop kind of kicked me awake. And then we, uh, and it was a famous park from the 60s, People's Park. There was a big sort of riots to keep the park um, during the 60s. And then we grabbed a, a coffee in um, the Mediterranean Cafe where... Uh, the free speech movement. Well, in this is over in Berkeley. This yeah. is in Berkeley, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So the next morning, we get off. Um, my friend jumps off the train and falls, and I was very worried, but he was fine. And then we trudged our way through um, Berkeley. We grabbed a, the, you know, a meal at a cheap around, Chinese place. Well, well, remind me the yeah. years. Well, this was the early eighties. Wow, so there was still yeah. a bit of that Berkeley kind of the original Berkeley was still. It wasn't of, that. Yeah. I mean, sixty eight had been only four, 15 years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so so then we just you know I'm just, it was just a classic kind of showing up in California a little we weren't heavy hardcore hippies but you know there was a little bit of that yeah. I read Zen in the Art of Mot- Motorcycle Mains for the second time on the yeah. on the freight train and um, yeah a cop a cop kicked us awake I was in the cafe getting where the free speech movement was the conspirators met and concocted the free speech movement which kicked off the student movement in 1964 in in, in at UC Berkeley and then I did scratched my head and I grab what's this thing in my head and there was like a a, a a lice or something that I pulled out of my hair and it I squished it and it had my blood in it you know it was like it was I don't know it was like I'm alive I'm doing something it was a very free and pure and I don't know like a kind of extremely empowering extremely like I'm living I'm, I'm, I'm really alive it felt like a really alive experience uh, for me anyway when so you it was a great back, adventure yeah. when you look back at that now um, do you feel that do you feel a sense of you know, obviously you haven't gone and become a, <laughs> you know, you, you still live in a lot of this spirit, but do you feel like you've lost some of that edge or do you yeah, feel sure. like, yeah, yeah. I know, mean, does it, it, is parts it, of your brain fuse in and you have your, your, yeah. pr- your prudence uh, module of your brain, you know, sort of forms properly and you don't what quite about, do the, the... What about comfort? You know... Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, you, like you, you're well, not... Well, hell, I was just, I was just in Iowa knocking doors for Bernie, you know, like in the, in the cold. So you, you're... I guess you're going through the discomfort, but you're doing it more on a, more of a sort of focused mission rather than maybe a, yeah. a kind of a roustabout, maybe than just a sort of yeah. pure walkabout kind yeah. of thing. Though I think walkabout's a great term, isn't it? It absolutely yeah. is. Absolutely I love is. that from um, Australian indigenous culture, um, walkabout as, as this human need, like a kind of semi-nomadic moment in time. Right. I'm just going on walkabout. Right. And whether I, it comes I with a cannot tell you when I'll be back. <laughs> right, I don't know where I'm going. I don't, and I, I I know that I can't keep uh, keep doing what I'm doing, mm-hmm. and I need to, you know, I don't know that I I, I could not be um, properly respectful to the to the origins of that. Like I don't, I just it's basically I've plucked it out the 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 notion of walkabout. I don't yeah. really know yeah. if it's part of a vision quest in 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 Aboriginal culture or what. Yeah. So <laughs> well well we're you know we all have the same origins at some level we all come from the same place so I'd imagine there's there's elements of it floating through different cultures, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah yeah yeah. So yeah, that I think it felt very much that and um so yeah, I think the the risks the risk taking or the sort of stepping out of the physical com- you know stepping into physical discomfort is maybe more at the service of a of more focused yeah. missions now yeah. maybe or something and um, going back to the, the I was struck by the hobo character yeah um, I actually heard a great story recently about um, actually it's just I'll do the podcast recommendation now there's <laughs> a guy called Tom Knowles he's got an amazing podcast about meditation called the Vedic world my mm. wife uh, put me on to him mm. 
and she was put onto him by an amazing meditation teacher called Johnny Pollard, who also has a podcast. So anyway, they're all the, the solidarity between the podcast. But Tom Knowles <laughs> has a great story about hanging out with a sadhu holy man in India who relinquished all, all their worldly possessions. And I think he may even have been naked. Uh-huh. And like, you know, in today's world, it's it, it, particularly in the Western world, it's, it's almost impossible to fathom or situate what that might look like here without somebody wanting to arrest or institutionalize this person. But in Indian culture, this has a place. And Tom Knowles went walkabout with this Indian Mm -hmm. sadhu for six weeks and they ate out of um, trash cans. Okay. And his whole story was around gratitude and being alive and that everything he would eat from the dust, they were were going hungry for a couple, well, Tom was hungry. I don't know if the other guy was hungry. Um, Everything that this man would eat Tom was in some ways, I, I don't want to kind of, I can't remember exactly his words, so I won't misquote him, but there was, for me, there was a sense of maybe being repulsed by what the food was to come sure. out of the trash. But the sadhu, everything, he, his response was, this is the best. Right. And so there's a lot of the best. And for me, that spoke to like, he yeah. was just in life, alive of life so that's on one of Tom Knowles' podcast it's called The Vedic World there's the pr- plug for Tom yeah <laughs> you, you scratch my podcast and I'll scratch yours yeah well I yeah. Um, <laughs> no it's good so so the hobo yeah the, the reason I, I got on to that was about the hobo like we, we know nothing about this hobo right. and no. we don't know where he was coming from or going to and or, uh, or exactly why he was making the decisions he was like it was unclear like he, why are you getting off here is there really, you're going to find work here? I don't see that there's going to be work in this five, ten person town mm. in the middle of the desert. And um, and yeah, so we were doing it as a lark and this was his life. Yeah. So that's the yeah. other thing. You, so yeah. you get to see the kind of elements of, um, of class and, and, and the different stratas of society. And I think Hitchin kind of gives you a lens in underneath that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's like I was saying, mm. it's one way to, you're, you step outside your bubble. I mean, you're basically step out on the highway. All of America is driving by. You put out your thumb, and you don't know who's going to pick you up. Um, it's going to be a stranger, and it may be someone uh, from some walk of life that you've never encountered. Um, and I've run into all sorts of people, religious backgrounds and whatever. And there was one hitchhiking trip where I was visiting a friend uh, back in the college days, but a couple years after these other stories visiting a friend in Cornell, upstate New York. And I was trying to get down to New York City, and that was maybe a four, five, six-hour, seven-hour thing. I can't remember. Something like that. Somewhere like five, six hours. And um, I could have taken a bus. You know, that's what everyone (laughs) everyone getting from Cornell, uh, Ithaca, New York, um, to New York City would. But I was like, no, I'm going to hitchhike, you know, as part of this embracing life, embracing the experience. being fully alive, letting the adventure kind of have its way with me in a way. And so, um, so the first ride, there were two major rides. Um, and then there was a, uh, and there was a third experience later that evening, once I got to New York city, that kind of, that between the three of them really exposed the kind of class stratification and the incredible diversity, socioeconomic diversity in New York City. So the first, in, 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 in America, excuse me. So the first ride, or the first major ride was with um, a 20-something man and his wife, white people in a pickup. And they picked me up, and this is again in the 80s, so whatever. And they picked me up and they were really friendly through the pack in the back. I think I, I either was, I think I sat in the middle, in the middle of the, of the, of the, of the pickup front seater and they said yeah we'll drop you down the road we can take you a bit further but we have to stop uh you know stop at our at our home and pick up something or drop something off or or whatever so i kind of went with them and you know went off this small road and then up this back road and into a trailer park and they they have this large extended family um there were three generations you know kind of all knocking about in the yard and inside and it was pretty hard scrabble you know it was a uh you know what would be derisively referred to as white trash or, you know, whatever, white working class folks living in a trailer home, uh, you know, a series of trailer homes, um, kind of strewn in some kind of, kind of a little bit of a backwoods kind of a situation. And so I was like hanging out. And, you know, the 15-year-old kid was like looking in porn magazines in the corner and the matriarch of the family was <clears throat> kind of yelling at a few people. 
And, uh, you know, other folks were very happy to see each other and they, you know, threw some things in the back of the pickup and whatever, whatever. And, um, okay, so I'm just sort of like dropped into this world that I would never otherwise, you know, be in unless I was like a, you know, community organizer or, or, or any number of other things that would take me out of my world into their world. And um, it was just a kind of, you know, whatever, uh, a revelation and people were incredibly inviting and friendly and not at all, ash you know, ashamed or anything to sort of let me into their home, you know, though sort of someone <clears throat> who might be sort of upper middle class and never have seen anything would have sort of looked down on these people. I was, I was noticing the difference between my, my upbringing and theirs, but it was very, um, we were all on the level, you know, uh, just in terms of uh, regarding each other with, dig, you know, with, with respect and interest and whatever. So that was the first thing. They dropped me off down the highway. Might have been some small rides. And then the next ride was this big white Cadillac full of an African-American family. And so I rode in this white Cadillac with a three, again, three generations of an African-American family. We stopped at McDonald's, you know, got Big Macs. I paid for it, you know, as a sort of nice gesture to their, to their kindness. And they couldn't get me to the city because they were going to their, they were lived in a housing project, what we, you know, public housing project, but I guess you call, uh, I don't know, in England at least, estates or something, mm -hmm. that, that kind of an equivalent. And so um, I then kind of went into their home uh, while they could try and roust me up a ride to take me into the city. So this was a really tough space. You know, this was like, a, you go in, half the elevators are broken, the other half of them smell like urine. Um, you know, there was like the liquor, the liquor store sort of across the street from this housing project, just maybe 20 stories high, is, um, you know, all, you know, like all with iron, iron grates on it, like the, you know, 15 year old kids are in the, in the sort of hard scrabble yard outside, like doing kind of like kung fu moves on each other, uh, you know, playfully. And um, so then I'm sitting in their living room and they're trying to find me a ride into the city. And eventually their brother-in-law of one of their sisters, I think there were 14, the, the, the mother had 14 different children. And the one, of her, one of her sons was the person driving the car and sort of was a, was a cab driver from Ghana. And so they put me in the cab and drove me into Manhattan. And then I went to a party uh, that a friend of mine was having, and his parents were extraordinarily wealthy, lived at like one Fifth Avenue. And there were like hors d'oeuvres showed up uh, on a platter, you know, on like 15 stories up on this like incredibly, you know, three bedroom plush Manhattan apartment. And I was just like, America's fucked, man. It's just like this should we should be way more equal. This is like I have just transited through like all of these different socioeconomic divides from an Ivy League college to a trailer home to a, um, a housing project uh, to like an elite uh, or dervd uh, yeah elite or dervd you know served party with a college friend you know it was just like it really opened my I mean I already knew that intellectually but it was experientially it was a it was like um, a Dan you know like a Fellini-esque or a Dante-esque mm -hmm kind of going through all of these realms. Mm. Um, I don't own a car, so I haven't nearly paid back my hitchhiking karmic debt at all. So, and it's a bit, um, uh, when I'm renting a car, I always try and, you know, pick up hitchhikers, but I can't really do that when I'm driving in somebody else's car and mm. say, hey, can you can you pay off my, my, my yeah, hitchhiking yeah. karmic debt by slowing yeah. down and picking up this person? Yeah. Um, but I'm always trying to do that. But it is um, an unusual thing to do. You know, thousands of cars go past you and it's the rare one that slows yeah. down. So it's yeah. a real act of, of sort of generosity. It's a real act of trust on their part to do that. They don't know who you are, right? Yeah. They don't, you know, like. Yeah. And. Um, They're bringing you into your, their in, home. Into their home, into their car. And because you do hear that all the time. Yeah. You're like, are you crazy? You picked up a hitchhiker right. and then next thing you brought them into their home. They've got kids there, everything. So. Right. And, and so there's a real unknown. So there was a, there was, um, I remember adding to a, I would have a hitchhiking sign and I remember adding to it, will ride in the back of the pickup. Like, and I was hitchhiking around the desert. This is a little later. It wasn't just in my, when I was 19 or 20, but a little later. And I remember a woman slowed down. She had a young kid in, it was in a pickup and she slowed down. She had a young kid in the thing and she said, and she's like, you can ride in the back. And I was like, Totally cool. Of course. Like, you don't know me. Yeah. I'm a man. You're a woman alone. Yeah. You know, I'm very happy to get into the back of your pickup. And that's that was within her comfort zone. Yeah. And it was certainly fine for me. Um, 
And I had explicitly sort of, you know, offered that in the yeah. Kind of tried to make yeah. it as big as I could on the on the on the second half of the sign or a second mm. sign. Anyway, I think there's there's a lot in that around the generosity of spirit to allow people into each other's lives at whatever level they're comfortable with. Um, I was particularly interested in this story because I uh, spent yesterday in the Bronx at a at a public high school uh, that was predominantly not just African American but Latino and. Uh, let's just say the very distinct minority of, of white kids there that I saw anyway. And we had a great discussion with the teenagers there around uh, prejudice mm-hmm. and how in many ways the, the Bronx is demonized and how kids are demonized and why that might be. And, you know, like I actually had such a beautiful day, mm, but wonderful. they invited us in and made us feel welcome and told us their stories and... You know, a lot of those stories were um, were actually hard. You know, they they um, they were kind of opening up to um, just some of the this tough t- tough. I mean, I don't want to try and I can't do justice to their stories right this moment, but um, they've seen too much for their years. Let's yeah. put it that way. Yeah. You know, um, but there was a universal kindness there uh, yeah. that transcends race and class and yeah and um, but we can't it's very hard to make that to transcend unless we have the invitations to cross over the divide you know and and then likewise to 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 make the invitation and to respond to the invitation to offer the invitation um it's a tough one you know because it's easy to hang out in your ghetto and I think we're all, well, I, I don't want to say we're all, but many of us are certainly in our own ghettos and bubbles and silos mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I include myself very much in that. Um, so, yeah, it makes for a richer, richer life in many ways. I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, um, maybe the there is a sort of strange trust that happens in the hitchhiking in that hitchhiking negotiation. Right. You're making yourself very vulnerable standing outside you know, putting your thumb out on the road. And they're also, like, you're, you're basically giving people the benefit of the doubt. You're trusting in the best of humanity in, in both stepping out onto, you know, putting your thumb out on the road and also slowing down to pick somebody up. So there's mm. something, I don't know, I haven't read your read your book and, uh, you know, I only heard about it <laughs> yesterday. Um, but I think, I'm, I imagine that's sort of part of, um, a kind of at the center of it. Is that yeah, sort of, yeah. Trust in humanity. Yeah. yeah, yeah. At a time where we're we're kind of there is a narrative around uh, fear humanity, fear each other. The other is coming for you. Hide, run, run for your living room and close the doors and close the windows. Right. Uh, and run that, for your Reddit thread. Yeah, and that that leads to a poor life. You know, you might have a lot of material wealth, but is it is it is it offering life of experience and story how many stories do we get out of that uh but i i also like the 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 value of uh having the current of safety running through this as well and uh, like there was one kid told me a story yesterday about having a knife pulled on him and his primary experience or lesson from it was to be more vigilant in his own life Mm -hmm. and that's not a bad thing right yeah yeah it's a balance right yeah and that's i guess um well along the lines of what you said about the hitchhiking experience that broke your trust and you had to sort of you had to sort of find a new footing after that yeah right and so it's yeah. a balance it's a yeah. balance of uh you know whatever judging your level of safety and then taking risk and sort of um sort of re-engaging the adventure and kind of taking the risk again same with the heartbreak thing similar similar structure yeah uh to yeah. things um and i guess you know, the, you could say the current presidential uh, battle in this country is similar uh, between <clears throat> you've got a current president who, uh, to, in order to his modality of how he keeps his coalition together, how he how he rules is to demonize, is to split the country in half and, you know, demonize uh, one half. Right. And like uh, the, the current um, rising contender on the other side, Bernie Sanders, is is like a, you know, building a multiracial, you know, working class coalition. And so it's, no, it's by um, finding 
common ground and uh, uniting. Uh, I don't know. Mm. It's like through love and compassion and a kind of hope, right? So it's like, uh, is it a hope-driven politics or a fear driven politics? Is it hope and compassion that you're building that's the sort of spiritual glue, if you will, or the spiritual engine of your um, of your politics um, and the coalition you're building? Or is it a kind of fear and demonization? You know, and we have that very, 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 I think, stark choice before us in America. So it's mm-hmm. just, it runs not just through our lives and through hitchhiking, but through uh, through the sort of DNA of our politics. And I want, I want you to tell me, Andrew, a bit about, because uh, there's a lot about hope and kindness here, but I think you've been picking on billionaires a little bit too much from what I've been reading. Uh, you've got a bit of a... I'm only, I'm only joking with you now. No, no, uh, it's okay. Um, <laughs> uh, d- d- you've got some fun stories from your campaigns around... Uh, we have a mutual friend in Chuck Collins. Right. You had him on the previous podcast. So. Yeah, Chuck has a bit of a... somewhat of a residency on the podcast. Oh, We've done two. One, one of my very first interviews and... Uh, subsequently did a live event in Dublin uh, which was packed house yeah wow yeah he's a great guy he is great he's yeah. a great storyteller and he's a deep soul and you know he's also you know uh, kind of really sharp and knowledgeable and analytical about our you know ecological and uh, economic situation so he's a he's a mentor I'd yeah. say to me yeah he was a boss of mine at uh, at uh, Share the Wealth which became United Fair Econ- Fair united for a fair economy and um we've stayed friends and i think of him as a as one of my sort of pole stars and one of my mentors yeah. uh, and you, you go back a while from what i believe and uh like chuck's story for anyone that hasn't uh listened to the interviews with him i'd encourage you to do so but part of it was inheriting um quite a quite a, an amount of wealth that would have meant he wouldn't have to work again from what i understand and ultimately gave away his wealth and has had quite an interest uh, or more than quite an interest an intense interest in wealth and who has wealth and why not and how do we distribute it and have a fair economy fair society um so the the interest in millionaires and billionaires chuck has actually worked with billionaires and bill gates father he wrote a book with him right. he works with patriotic millionaires patriotic millionaires yeah. which and a, and a antecedent organization called responsible wealth which mm. sort of operated in the same way which was uh, organizing instead of just instead of organizing working people um, or community members, but organizing very wealthy people to uh, advocate for a more equal distribution of wealth and 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 income and limits, you know, maximum wage and limits on on concentrated wealth and stuff like that. And and by doing, it's a it's a potent strategy because it's not what the media or anyone is expecting. Here are these millionaires, centimillionaires, billionaires saying we should be taxed more. Right? We shouldn't. Wealth is too concentrated, including it's too concentrated in my hands. And that's just sort of both. It's it's very um, like a man bites dog kind of a story that's unusual. And and it kind of uh, immediately kind of makes you want to lean in and listen and understand why someone would be saying that. But then it's also like an incredibly a kind of an effective spokesperson uh, for that kind of uh, change in society to have it be coming from the people who will not benefit from it. So there's got to be some kind of ethical good about it. So that's interesting. Yeah. I mean, he does. He organizes with, with people of all classes, yeah. but when he does organize the wealthy to speak for society at large and against their own narrow self-interest, it's a kind of, it's a disruptive in a very, in a very sort of helpful way, yeah. a kind of voice to bring into the mix. Yeah. And speaking of disruption, uh, creative, uh, Playful disruption has right. been a large part of your work. Yeah, and, Chuck and, and I did a lot of creative campaigns around um, uh, around the sort of unequal distribution of wealth, you know, in the United States. And then I've sort of continued uh, with creative campaigns of one kind or another. I think you were referring to earlier a kind of a series of campaigns we did, um, mm, ch- you know, challenging concentrated wealth by pretending to be uh, the extremely wealthy, pretend, pretending to be billionaires. So it originated as a, as a fun sort of street theater organization called the um, Rich People's Liberation Front, right? Anyway, and then it transitioned to more focused on intervening in uh, our, our presidential elections. Um, and we kind of created organizations that were like 
Billionaires for Bush was the sort of most well-known one, um, where we, you know, we dress up in, um, we did this for, for years, for many different, uh, but mostly in the 2004 during Bush's re-election. And we would dress up in tuxedos or gowns and tiaras or big Texas oilman sort of 10-gallon hats um, with signs like, um, you know, this is Bush's re-election. So we paid for four more years um, uh, or blood for oil. Uh, or, um, you know, take to your cell phones, take to your faxes, join the fight to end all taxes, you know. Uh, and, you know, so sort of making fun of activist protest culture, but, but kind of uh, filling it with a very you know, unexpected, surprising, wait, why are billionaires protesting? What are they protesting mm -hmm. for? Which, which, which is quite appealing to, for the media. To, yes. to, I mean, you've had a lot of success. It was with, very, yeah. you know, very uh, mediagenic, as they say, a very attractive kind of uh, thing to the media. And it was also a kind of sly way to make a class argument, but not by like, you know, resentful complaining, you know, people who didn't get enough, right? But by the people who got everything and I want more, uh, you know, and sort of like inhabiting the voice of the extremely wealthy and, and kind of, in a sort of ripping the mask off, but in a funny way and revealing, uh, you know, their agenda or their ideology, but in this sort of playful, ironic kind of way was a very, um, I think it was sort of a very revealing uh, move to make. And, and the media was all too happy, the liberal media was all too happy to sort of play with it. And it was a way for them to have a sharper class politics back, you know, 10, 15 years ago when it was less, there was less of a, um, a consensus that inequality was a problem. Um, so we kind of got around some of the, the, the sort of filters, you know, the, the limits um, in the media of being able to, you know, challenge, uh, you know, challenge you know, capitalist inequality by, by pretending to be the, mm. uh, in a sort of overblown, larger than life, uh, over the top uh, kind of buffoonery of, of, of the wealthy themselves. And, and then the media just ate it up, and at one point at our height, we had a hundred chapters of these little uh, groups of folks dressing up and showing up uh, at all these kind of, uh, you know, outside events or campaign events or debates or whatever, and um, kind of getting this uh, this notion into the media stream of, of this sort of, ex the, the distortions that happen to democracy and to society and even to health outcomes by extreme concentrations of wealth. And now it's now it's sort of a understood part of the discourse and an understood part of what's wrong with America. But it wasn't back in, in, in you know, when we started this, basically. Um, we ran it, yeah, like 15 years ago, say. Mm -hmm. So it was a very helpful, helpful to sort of open up uh, sort of media and cultural space for this conversation. And I'm, I'm assuming that the lessons from that have informed your book and Beautiful Trouble and you have the revolution in a box with <laughs> Beautiful Trouble. Uh, can you tell me about your current work and all the different variety of writing and training and organizing and yeah, host, you're I'm hosting a <laughs> community gathering every month. And mm -hmm. um, But yeah, tell me about Beautiful Trouble. So yeah, cool. Um, after having done cr creative campaigns and uh, like the billionaires for Bush and 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 others, and having met other people doing similar things, like maybe um, your audience is familiar with the Yes Men who do you know uh, corporate pranks and um, uh, or you know it's all sorts of street theater and creative campaigning that have been happening you know from and and not just um, you know wacky humor stuff but like you know innovative creative um, protests like act. Act up, for example, or you know, Greenpeace's banner banner hangs, or or their sort of uh, uh, direct action blocking of fossil fuel infrastructure, and there's just a, uh, a there was a flourishing of creative practice in in uh, gaining media, in um, interrupting business as usual, in, uh, in engaging uh, larger numbers of people in uh, in protest and in resistance and in organizing. Uh, in lobbying, whatever. So there was a whole flourishing of that kind of uh, bringing a creative spirit and a trickster spirit and a more of an artistic sort of set of artistically inspired strategies into the, the political mix. And we felt, um, you know, with Occupy and uh, Indignados, uh, et cetera, and now on into Extinction Rebellion and whatever. And we felt that um, 
we should get some of these practitioners, some of these leading practitioners, and we brought 70 uh, artists, activists, strategists of, who were sort of in that creative space together to kind of bring all their wisdom together in a way that uh, others could easily understand it and apply it. Um, and so we kind of landed on like a toolbox kind of a structure for it. And we first did it in a sort of book form. And it ended up being like a 500-page book with like 150 little chapterettes, 10 little, you know, kind of organizations um, that are sort of on operating in that sort of space sort of helped to support it. And 70 different practitioners from mostly in North America, but actually all over the world. Um, um, and kind of built it into these little... Um, uh, single idea sized pieces uh, and we broke that down into like tactics principles theories you know whatever and so like for example the tactics might include um, civil disobedience or a banner hang or a human banner where people like form letters with their bodies and it, you take an aerial photo and it and it becomes a kind of a helps to build a media story or um, or principles basically like uh, the uh, insights that practitioners in the sort of creative, you know, creative activism are using, whether they sort of even realized it themselves, what their sort of yeah. shorthands were, yeah. um, their, their rules of thumb. And it, like, for example, like make the, make the invisible visible was like a sort of central one. You, there may be a problem, but if the public can't see it, they don't sort of, you know, when we can't see it as a problem, whether that's a simple physically say, as um, that there's uh, invisible toxins in the water, uh, in the water table. And so like kind of lighting a match to your faucet and having it um, flame on, then you're sort of like, that's a kind of like evidence that there's a, that there's a toxin, you know, that fracking is actually polluting um, the, yeah, our water systems, right? So that's like sort of making the visible, uh, making the invisible visible. And it can happen in more like social invisibility. Um, through unemployment, it may be just a problem that you're not aware of until people start telling telling stories that have a resonance in the culture, um, or for you know people who are suffering from foreclosures and living out of their cars, unless that's uh, sort of made visible through um, uh, by you know people driving their cars and you know sort of showing them to the media or whatever, or or doing a sort of um, a portrait gallery. Uh, like on the sh a mobile portrait gallery in the streets and parking it outside of the housing authority, then the people can't recognize it's a problem. So that's just sort of one principle. Um, show, don't tell. Um, breakfast is persuasive, you know? Like that's just sort of a curious one. Like one way to organize is to provide hot breakfast. I mean, the Black yeah. Panthers did this in the 60s and um, uh, social justice programs of churches, you know, have done this for decades. Um, so it's like these kind of mm. little... Um, uh, what we you might call just uh, shorthand like design principles for making for creative campaigns and creative action. So we kind of put that all into the book, and they it's, everything was like a single idea sized thing, so that it would be easy for people to grab a hold of it, have a kind of activist choose your own adventure, sort of wandering around the book, finding what they needed when they needed it, and not have to slog through three hundred pages to yeah. get a thesis. Yeah, of, yeah. Of, of our sort of political moment, but yeah. rather something. These were kind of perennial, uh, to some degree, you know, a little bit culturally dependent, but often just uh, this book, this collection of practices and collection of tactics and uh, are, uh, yeah, perennials. They're almost like sort of, these will work in many different, or they're, they're, they have enough concreteness and enough generality that you can grab a hold of it and see how to apply it to your particular problem in particular situation. Was, was there a, a, a childhood part of you that would have revealed that this would have been your, your journey? Mm -hmm. Was there, what was the, like... That is a great question. I think there was a huge interruption between... No, I don't think I could draw a, a strong through line from, from my childhood to... What was the interruption? Uh, you know, just take enough drugs and college and yeah um a kind of and a kind of an activist empowerment um aha moment yeah, yeah. you know and i'm sure that the hitchhiking was probably yeah it was part. during that era yeah. you know during yeah, that so, era, so late teens early family 20s. wise and upbringing you, you yeah could no i grew up in a liberal i mean i grew up in a liberal household my dad was a, a chemistry professor at, at new york university um grew up 
you know, in a re- Midwest Republican, you know, white bread kind of a, uh, uh, but, but became, this is dating, you know, he, <laughs> this is going way back because he broke with his family by voting for FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Your father? It, yes. Yes. So, um, uh, so he kind of became, you know, not a crazy radical, but, a, you know, liberal and a scientist and, you know, uh, broke with his Christian mm. faith, but always loved singing in, mm. you know, the church music, but, but broke sort of theologically with and, his faith. And your mother? My mother's parents were, came over in 1914 from Romania, Jewish, settled in Brooklyn, and she went to college for free back when America, you know, worked better for everyone, um, and became a librarian, and they met in the library at NYU, and everyone, like, loves that part of the story. And I grew up in New York, um, so liberal, um, but not, um, yeah, and so, the, I don't know, like, it's, uh, I, childhood, let me think, um, I mean, I always had a bad sense of humor growing up, you know, I always liked puns, I liked word games, so that, you know, um, but for the most part, English, English, like, the fact that I became, a, I've become a book an author of several books is a very strange thing to me because I was more of a math science guy, you know, and a bit of a, a bit tightly wound, you know, kind of not, not a, I don't think I was a free, particularly no one would have necessarily said I was a free, such a crazy, you know, anarchist free spirit kind of, you know, growing up or anything. So I don't know. It just came from, uh, I think, like, yeah, just a kind of almost religious level uh, awakenings that happened, several of them, um, in that in that era when we were, that same time of life when I was doing the hitchhiking and the freight jumping, and they were a mixed, yeah, so some of those experiences, some drug experiences, which I think, you know, just kind of broke me open yeah. in some important ways, and, and a experience of joining in a large scale direct action when I was 19 um, focused on a nuclear weapons laboratory in California. I spent a year, uh, I took a year off college in the middle of college. Part of one of the big freight jumping trips was to get out to California for that year and I participated in a like a 1500 person strong mass civil disobedience to try to shut down uh, the big nuclear weapons laboratory out there, the sister laboratory to Los Alamos, where they developed a nuclear bomb in the 40s. This is called the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, uh, out just uh, like an hour east of uh, San Francisco, and uh, got arrested with, da- you know, uh, Wavy Gravy and Daniel Ellsberg and uh, Starhawk, and it was, a you know, 1,500 of us, and that was... Uh, uh, and just sort of taking... Uh, like a nice middle class boy kind of breaking the law, just that. I mean, it sounds so simple, but it was like a kind of a big deal for me. Um, I was always kind of like a do gooder, goody two shoes kind of what, I, not a rebel mm. per se, mm. and just realizing that uh, I had the right to participate in history, to be part of history, to take action against um, something that I that was wrong, even though the experts said it was fine, even though people I would have previously trusted, uh, you know, said, no, everything, we've got everything under control. Like, no, you don't. Yeah. And we have to interrupt that. It's a big, it's a big yeah. realization. It's yeah. actually at the core, I would feel, of empowerment where yeah. you say, I, I don't believe you anymore, you know. That, and it's scary. It's terrifying. Yeah, yeah you it think, is. You, yeah. Think, you yeah. think the people in charge have things under control yeah. and then you realize that they don't. Yeah. It's, on the one hand, terrifying. Yeah. And then you realize... You, it's terrifying and liberating, and liberating. Yeah, but it's also yeah. like then you have the. It's your responsibility. Yeah. To sort of try to. Yeah, you don't get to blame people so much either, because yeah, yeah. And then you sort of yeah. take action, and you realize, wow, I, this is now I'm now I'm responsible for the whole rest of my life as just a citizen of the planet, a citizen of my country. I yeah. must, I must continue to try to right the ship because the ship is, mm. is is um, pointed in the wrong direction. And about, you know, in our case, you know, <laughs> anyway. That's um, interesting you would use the word responsible, you know, just that, of course, we, we have rights and we want rights and we demand rights, but we also have responsibilities, don't we? Particularly to our planet. Yeah. Um, and, and 
despite everything right now, and we are in, in kind of troubling times in many ways, um, you, you strike me as a very hopeful guy. And I'm wondering, well, you know, I'm sure you have your have, day. I, I'm sure you have your days. Yeah, sure. Yeah, but, but on the whole, you're, you're energized, yeah. you're, you know, Doing stuff. you have fire in your belly. Uh, so on the whole, I would make that judgment. I know it's, uh, and I, I'm wondered what is what is the food and the fuel that is feeding you. Well, that's it's a it's a funny situation. I am I'm a I'm a high as you can as any anyone who's been listening can tell. I, I'm I'm a fast talking New Yorker. I have a lot of I I rev high. Um, you know, I'm happy to be alive. I love people. You know, I like the uh, to you know feel the pulse of life, you know, so that is just at a, just a purely energetic at the cellular level. I'm, I'm energized and I, I like to give humanity and just people I meet, like we're talking about hitchhiking, give people the benefit of the doubt. I like to trust in our better natures as, you know, I think if I remember correctly, as Lincoln, you know, would say, um, um, the angels of our better natures rather than the, the, you know, our darkest sort of fears and impulses. I like to sort of lean into that. I just think it's just a better, a healthier way to live. Better for, um, uh, better, f- you get better social, you know, we're, uh, we're going to do better as a society if more people do that. Um, so, but like, Yes, so I'm kind of, that's how I roll. I think just sort of by character, energetically. But I am not, like, when I look at trends and when I think about the tasks before us and the, uh, like, in term, particularly in terms of transitioning as fast as we possibly can off of fossil fuels and onto a more sustainable um, uh, economic systems and ways of life. I am heartbroken and I don't know if pessimistic is the right word, but I am, I have crazy amounts of, of, of grief and battle depression and battle, uh, the impossibility, difficulty, uh, near impossibility of that, of that task. And I, I, I think just the so, you know, you have a, I have a head-heart kind of contradiction going on. Yes, my heart is in this game, is in this fight. I'm wired that way. But um, I am also have an analytical part of me, and, and that analytical part of me uh, tells me we're fucked. And so that's the contradiction I've been thinking about and writing about most uh, of late, is that um, kind of it's an you know, the, the, how to hold those two pieces. Um, and so I am currently been working for a while. I've been interviewing, uh, client, climate scientists and like grief counselors and, um, political, like eco-political strategists, uh, community, you know, organizers, um, about who I think have, uh, been also thinking like trying to hold those both of those pieces and uh, so the current set of interviews and, and, and writing that I'm doing I'm pulling it together into a book uh, bringing my traditional humor to bear on it uh, called I Want a Better Catastrophe and because I think we're going to get a catastrophe we're in a we're, we're, in in an un- we're in one we're in an unfolding catastrophe it's going to Uh, get a lot worse uh, before it gets better, if it ever gets better. And so then, and yet here I am, as you said, like a high rev energy committed, you know, knocking doors for Bernie, um, you know, creating, uh, helping people uh, kind of uh, come up with their own creative campaigns for whatever justice cause they they have before them. You know, I'm in the fight. Um, I'm in, in the fight, fight with joy and moxie and the trickster spirit, and I'm in, and I bring all that, um, and it's a, it's it's in my bones, and yet, and yet I'm I'm, um, I think we're receiving what I call impossible news from the climate scientists, and how do we, how do we metabolize that, uh, and how do we find a 
spiritual, philosophical, moral, whatever you want to call it, uh, existential sort of rationale or framework or, or just uh, a story or a paradigm that allows us to sort of proceed, both um, being wired for hope and being wired for compassion, and then also holding this impossible news about our uh, climate future that we're already seeing, as you say, sort of unfolding. Mm-hmm. And obviously it's uh, some of us are protected for a little while yet, while others are um, on the very sharp end of it. Um, uh, whether, you know, in California or Australia fires or their islands in the Pacific are going under or, um, you know, the thousand people in uh, New Orleans during Hurricane Katrina who were in low-lying, low-lying land and um, weren't able to mobilize out, you know, whatever. Like, uh, there's an extremely asymmetry of the impacts, but we're all in this, <laughs> you know, we're all, you know, we're all in this together at a certain level and then we're all at, you know, whatever. Uh, we're also not. But anyway. Yeah. So I, anyway, that's the current project and the current thing that's occupying it, my heart. It's, it's in some ways, uh, trying to, uh, discern where we are in the great story um, mm. and what the next chapter is and what comes to mind is, you know, almost like the hero's journey where, Inevitably, there's you, the, the the dragon and the monster, whether it be in Harry Potter, or Star Wars, whatever you know, you face near death, imminent death, and the the heroic hour is required, mm. and we're in the heroic hour, and uh, you know, but it's our choice, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. We still, it's not like, like it's right. not over till it's over. It's not over till it's over, and. You know, some people wax really philosophical about this, you know, no species lasts forever, you know, extinction is in our future, but even, even if it's in our far, far, far future, we're only here for a while. I mean, people go there. I don't like going there as a way to avoid engagement as a sort of, as a way to go, go quietist. Um, But it's, it, it helps with the sort of cosmic perspective of it all. Um, um, and we always have a choice. And so whether that's, sh- that choice is how to get our, make our way through or whether it's how to uh, be together as it all unravels, you know, how to be the best we can be, how to be compassionate and kind in spite of, uh, the catastrophe, the unfolding catastrophe and the unraveling and the, and the stress of all of that. And the, the sort of easy, you know, the kind of the easy thing is just to slide into this kind of nihilism and um, fragmentation and distrust of the people around you. You know, whether it's climate refugees coming into Europe or across uh, the U.S. border or whatever, um, or to step up to the best in ourselves and um, uh, realize that we made this mess, particularly the people uh, who have money and who live in the global north. We made this mess and. Uh, we need to take responsibility for it and um, we need to be our best, most compassionate uh, selves and try, this is a global problem and we need to come together and address it at the, at the highest and at the, both the community and also at the highest sort of levels and see our common humanity um, in, in, in this sort of multi-crisis. It's, it's a it's multi-dimensional crisis that we're in. Anyway, um, so yes, we have a choice and we should choose to be the best we can be um, in it. Um, whether we can fix it, quote unquote, or not, uh, we need to, uh, as one person I interviewed with, we somehow need to partner with the crisis. We need to dance with it. In this, it was, she's a hardcore community organizer in Detroit. Yeah. And so she said, we have to somehow find a way to partner with it. And that and was we- like, Whoa, that is quite a spiritual uh, challenge. I'm going to add to that. Say we need to hitchhike with the crisis. Uh, uh, We'll we'll say more. (laughs) Hitchhike into the crisis and on the crisis. You know, for me, hitchhiking is uh, is just a is just a metaphor, and uh, I feel I feel it may be appropriate that we begun this on a hitching this conversation on a hitching journey that we end one. You know, 
that I, I reach out my thumb to you and you mm. give me a lift, as, mm-hmm. as we say, a lift in Ireland and a, a ride in the US. But a okay. ride in Ireland means something quite different. Uh, it's, yes. Uh-huh. Uh, it's a bit more romant- <laughs> on the romantic side of things. Uh, and yeah, we reach out to each other, as you say, we partner with each other, partner in and during the crisis. And it's the togetherness, isn't it? Our, our, the sharing of the road together. And I think it's not a time to stand alone. You know, absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. on we go. Yeah. Whether you have a, uh, the darkest sort of take on things or the hopefulest take, it's not a time to stand alone. Yeah. Self-compassion and kindness for, for, for each other and, uh, ourselves, you know, cause I, I was struck that you, you raised depression and, and, uh, I think the field of mental health is not, separate from this you know uh, obviously there are many dimensions to that realm uh, but the fact that if the world's going to hell in a handbag and the shit show around you as Krishnamurti said how can you be how can you I think he said something like how can you be well in a 6C mm. so I mean one way we can be well is to to maybe swim together and uh and also clean up the sea while we're doing it. Andrew, it was absolutely a great treat and privilege to meet you and to share your stories and to hear your stories and to learn from you and uh, appreciate all the great work you're doing and thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you. Hello, Rory here again. I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, I'd encourage you to share it with friends or people you think might be interested through social media through email through whatsapp or whatever way you feel called if you want to support the podcast please consider becoming a once off or monthly donor chip in five dollars five euro whatever it is once off or monthly uh loveandcourage.org loveandcourage.org if you're interested in checking out my book hitching for hope it's available through all main book sites Uh, release dates not until the end of may in the us and canada and elsewhere but you can order through various sites and you can find links at hitchingforhope.com hitchingforhope.com thanks so much for all your support until next time here's to you to all of us to a world of more love and courage